All right. So welcome back to another episode of You're in Charge, Now What? Um, I am uh, joined today by two of some of my favorite people in, in, in the industry and just in general that I've run across, Kyle Mouncier and Paul J. Daly, who are the founders of Asodu, which is the Automotive State of the Union, and a myriad of other things that we'll talk about today. But why I brought them on here today is to help you understand how they do all the things they do. Because a few months ago, maybe a little longer, we had a podcast, they were here and they were saying, well, what exactly are they building over there? Well, they're further down the road. So we want to talk about that, but we want to go behind the scenes because I don't think a lot of people really understand the behind the scenes of you guys. So thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks yeah, for having absolutely. us. Thanks for having us. Just being on with you relaxes it's, me. This is good. like... This is a, your a Soto exposed. Time. It's going to be yeah. great. A Soto exposed. Soto exposed. A Soto exposed. Wow, you, that's you could do the like expose it. thing, Glenn. You're nice enough, and people like you that they wouldn't see it coming. You know, <laughs> I, I think that's it. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the nicer guy here. So you are. Um, let's talk about that because last time you guys were here, this was sort of it was going, but I think. It was right after Kyle joined, maybe a little while longer, and you guys came up with this vision of creating a communication platform. Notice I'm not saying network. Uh, communication platform out to the automotive industry and beyond, really. But it was different because what you were saying is the communication channels or platforms that were out there excluded a large number of the people who worked in that industry. So whatever platform was out there, it could have been directed from the manufacturer viewpoint or the dealer principal viewpoint, or we want to do a, get this in front of the dealers and the leaders in the dealership. And you went at it a little bit differently to say, well, what about everyone else? One, why don't they know about all of those things that are being discussed at that high level, which they should, or how it impacts them, or also how to just connect them to this wonderful industry that they're part of, and that there's a career here, and there's more than just your little piece. And so I always admired that. So so that's where you were starting. So we're just going to actually, going? Glenn, we're just going to take you on the road and you, and you, you can explain what you we do. <laughs> <laughs> He's just explain what we do better than we ever can. Well, then you That's can so save good. this and play it again. So tell me, how, how is it going? Like, how are you on that vision? Because there's, a, you know, people watching you guys, there's a lot of new things popping up and splintering, which I like. So tell me, how's it going? Very similar to how it goes when you get on a really great roller coaster for the first time. Some moments you're like, this is the best thing I could ever yeah. imagine and doing with my time. The other moments is like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And so it's a lot like that. I mean, it's kind of like the entre entrepreneur's journey. But, you know, like joking aside about that, well, it's not really joking. It's kind of true. But the the reality of what we're seeing, how it's going Mm -hmm. is we're starting to see the mentality that we set out to plant in people's minds and hearts of what you do at a dealership is so much more than cars that a focus on taking care of one another and taking care of the consumer is actually what's going to help us all get better. And when we start talking and thinking in those terms, everything changes, even down to the, the details. Like we focus on operations more. We focus right. on technology and marketing more because all of a sudden the framework for thinking of it has been shifted. And so how it's going is that we're seeing the shirts, the love people more than you love car shirts around mm -hmm. the internet when we're like, oh, I don't, I didn't know they had one or they were even paying attention to us or orders right. come in, or we start hearing references to things that we're doing. And sometimes without even like crediting back to what we're doing, but we know like, hey, we planted that seed. Like it doesn't have our name on it, but we know we planted that seed. And right. when we see the original roster, like from OG Asodu, the people that we had relationship with mm -hmm. and had on the programming, and we know that that was like a broader introduction to the industry. And then we've watched them go, not saying that we are the reason for their success, but we kind of feel like the record label that's like, this person is doing it right. You right. should know about this person. And so like, those are the indicators for me when I look at it, like how it's going, you know, the, the intangible tangibles that, that 
kind of encourage us on a regular basis to just like keep swinging the ax. I like that. Kyle, what, 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 what are you seeing? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we do some consulting in the industry and we've worked, you know, in our, in our other roles for brand, brand marketing and really mm -hmm. emphasizing like mission, vision, values, and brand and know who you are and where you're going and what you're doing. And I think because, well, one, we have, we've tried some things that are just so out in left field that nobody's even like, nobody's even, you know, thought in their dreams that this should be something that someone in automotive should do. Um, you know, things like doing a live tonight show. Um, mm -hmm. What has happened through this time frame is like us really flexed and started to find out our position as what, um, what a, a soda really means to us and to the industry. Right? There were these times where we really, really focused on beating on a media company. You know, we're going to get mm -hmm. great at you know our morning podcast, which talks about the news and the daily email, which shares all all of what's going on in automotive. Um, and then there's been times where we're like, we're just entertainment, right? Here's here's an incredible conference or here's a, a local thing, or, you know, here's a live stream or video. Um, and, and then uh, as we've uh, started to develop this, uh, this more than cars series that we're working mm -hmm. on right now, that one episode has been released, we're releasing more. We've really started to expand the idea of more than cars into like every facet of what, of what we do and why we do it. Um, recognizing that, uh, yes, understanding what's going on in the industry. Yes, building a community around. Yes, highlighting the most progressive dealers. Yes, mm -hmm. um, creating content and entertainment that's actually like e makes it easier to consume the knowledge and information that uh, that makes sense to the industry. All of that creates the opportunity for us as an industry to make everything we do about more than just cars. Right, Paul? Last week he said you know, what, what we're doing when we have a panel session at a SoduCon regarding fixed stops, training technician and recruiting is really about more than cars. Like, All right. Tell me, tell me where you're at, Paul. <laughs> he goes, he goes, think about that. What that's doing is freeing up and enabling multiple families across the country to be introduced to these incredible dealers that want to recruit and train technicians so that that technician can have a great job and career path so they can support their family. Tell me that's not more about more than just cars. And so that's like that's starting to become a much more the vernacular of what we use internally and externally to say like the deep why on why we want to do webinars and why we have a daily email and why we ha throw events and why we have a show that's going to reach not just the industry, but also consumers. Uh, because we know that as we align more people with like the people side of the business and the more than cars really emphasis that, that that's core to us, like Paul and I. Right. Well, what I love and, and, and that makes complete sense. And, and you know, I was, I was writing down, okay, let me make sure we have all the things that they're doing. And I kept going, oh yeah, I forgot this. I forgot that. I forgot this, like your new <laughs> podcast, uh, Wheelhouse. The Wheelhouse. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That popped up the other day. And then you have auto collabs and you have the morning automotive troublemaker, uh, you know, your 15 minute little highlight reel. And then you have the newsletter, which my team loves as well, because uh, I, and I asked them, I said, why do you, what, what about the newsletter? Do you like, they go, it's fun. It's short, it's entertaining. And it's not just about cars, right? They're talking about what's going on in culture. They're throwing out these little tidbits. You know, this morning's was this day in history and Thomas Edison did this or some, you know, so it, it it's, you're looking forward to it because it's not just what you think it's going to be. Uh, so there is more involved and it's short. To, to allow people in, but going through all of those things, you know, the agency congruence in there somewhere and, you know, that's hiding in the back running <laughs> around. Right. And now you're doing, like you said, you're doing the soda con and you do your other lives. And I remember the first time I was up doing that, your very first show, you know, we were up doing that. And I thought that was a great start because it was just very relaxed. You know, it was everybody, there was no ego, there was no, well, this is designed only for this person. 
And I think what I'm taking, always taking out of it with this idea of more than cars, and it's always been something that struck me when I taught up at Northwood, which was, I don't think people, the the walk, run in the mill walking person walking around does not understand how big automotive is. If you yeah. ask the normal everyday person, even someone in your family, I mean, they know who you guys are, but if you asked them and said, if you were going to go into automotive in a career, what would you, what do you think? They'd all go salesperson because that's all they think about. Right. Yet, how many people does an average dealership employ? Hundreds. And, and they're usually the biggest employer in town. And there's just, look at all the vendor community and all of the manufacturers. It's just fascinating. And I think what you're doing is, to your point, is you're humanizing this to say, you could go to school and be a technician, have a phenomenal career. And you could work at the dealership down the street and make a lot of money and do great and, and take care of your family. Highlighting that is just should be seen as this is going to help the industry break down barriers of preconceived notion, but also expand it to be a choice to say, yeah. that's a good industry to go work in. Well, yeah, and, and I can't wait. You know, we talk like right now because we feel like the dealer is underexposed nationally. Um, both to the public and to internally to the, to the industry, right? It's a lot about the OEM. Um, the, the thing that I'm excited about too, and, and I think we'll get to this at some point as we can broaden the scope of what we do is like, there are hundreds upon hundreds, probably thousands of industry partners out there that are building really cool tech consulting, understand marketing and media, are are uh even like suppliers, OEM suppliers, these things that you just don't even think about mm -hmm. that are realities that it all works together. It's all a cog in the wheel of of making sure that everything happens in automotive. I I, I have told this story a couple of times, but I got this was probably a, a year ago or so. I got a random DM on LinkedIn from a guy that uh, was in Silicon Valley and uh, had spent a whole bunch of time uh, in in like enterprise tech, right? And had some pretty big titles uh, listed under his name, like legitimate person and just found through whatever content he was trying to follow, found me and mm -hmm. just reached out, scheduled a 30 on my calendar. And we spent 30 minutes, him just asking, about how cool automotive was and where he could fit in in the tech space, yeah. right? Like those are realities for sure. for for so many people outside of auto that I think because the pop culture narrative is getting so aligned with auto right now, there's just more and more energy toward that. And so whether it's dealership or industry partner, or OEM or supplier or anything like that, I one more. I'm I'm at a friend's house two weeks ago. Tell them and how you two, think, Kyle. <laughs> man, I'm gonna get after it. I'm at a friend's two week friend house two weeks ago, and uh, I they you know it was the first time I had been, and there was like four or five people there, and it was just one of the friends. And the one guy says to me, he's like, "What do you do?" I was like, "Oh, I'm in the automotive industry." And you should have seen these two other guys in the room. It it was like, "Oh, oh, oh, you you too." And I was like, oh, what do you guys do? <laughs> it was a right? me too moment. <laughs> yeah, it was like a big old me too moment. And I said, what do you do? Thinking like, oh, maybe they work at dealerships or maybe they're a technician or maybe. Well, one was a supplier and the other one, listen to this. This guy pinned himself in the automotive industry. He works for Geico in auto insurance. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, I'm in the auto industry too. How about Just that? Just expanding my thinking, right? How about sure. that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really fascinating because again and for a lot of people to to say they're in automotive and i know you guys have been fighting against this there was some sort of Shh, don't say it i'm in sales well mm. where i'm just in sales almost because of that <laughs> stigma versus saying uh, this is a, it's a craft and to your point yeah. is all of the people who interact with automotive. It's someone's job to drive that car and bring them over. You know, I met someone the uh, when I was traveling, I was uh, getting dinner 
And I was at a Buffalo Wild Wings. I was at a client and I started talking to the guy next to me. Sure enough, what did he do? He hauled Hondas back and forth from the plant to where it was. And we got talking. Hondas about aren't dealers. selling. A man doesn't have a job, right? Well, he's That's like, right. oh, I know this guy and I know that guy. And it be, just became this commonality of, oh, yeah, that makes complete sense. So and and I think you bringing that this content out, especially with the More Than Cars series, you know, this this series, which I want to really dive into a little bit to explain to the audience where that's going to be able to see the behind the scenes, because one of the funniest things years ago, we did a couple we used to do um, uh, surveys. You know, we were like buying surveys. How do you buy? And we did one for fixed ops. And we asked somebody in our fixed op survey why you don't service your vehicle at a dealership. Like, why do you go to? And they said, well, that dealership's not a local business. Think about what mm -hmm. they said. That's not a local business because it looks they've got the big brand logo on there and it's big. And they're thinking, well, that's not local, but yet it's probably staffed with so many local people. Absolutely. That is key for people to understand is that this is a local business and look at what the tax revenue and look at all the generosity and look at all the jobs that people have for that building. I think what you're doing with this series is because you're going at it through the people, people are going to go, oh, I know that per versus you're not going through it through the vehicle, right? That's an ad. Here's our car. You're going through it through the people to say, People like you work here. You might know this person and look how excited they are to work here. Look at them talking about a career. It becomes this advertisement of this industry, which is just coming at it from a very smart angle around the people versus selling them on culture and selling them on survey. But you're actually talking to people and they're sharing their journey and excitement. I think it's so, so smart. So tell me about that. I know when you launched the first one and you shared it with everyone your goal was to turn this into not just your own series but eventually getting it out to the public so talk to me about that vision so there's there's like a balance we try to strike with it because it's going to be very very clear that it's going to be welcomed well within the automotive industry mm -hmm. because everyone wants to see themselves look good right and i think if the auto industry when they watch one of these they can see the industry look good. Right. And there's going to be elements of it that most people relate to like, oh yeah, like that is how we feel. Or even if it's not fully true, right. You're going to see the romanticized version of yourself. Um, so we know that's going to be received well there. The point was, the point is to elevate the overall perception of the industry because we thought it was tragic that these owners and GMs and service writers, the people we see as like the best of the best when it comes to caring about one another, when it comes to leadership, when it comes to holding the community up, when it comes to trying obsessing over the customer experience. Like there are a lot of industries out there and I think you'd be really hard depressed to find one tripping over itself more to talk about the customer experience and right. wanting it to be better and wanting it yep. to be great. Right. And so we knew that if we could take all those ingredients that tragic element that the truth was not known by the general public. In fact, the stigma was opposite of what the truth is. And we could do that in a way that tells human stories. Like, why does anybody watch any documentary? Well, you could be a, like the subject matter, or you could really just like stories of people starting in one place and developing into something else, right? The transformation of the character is why anyone watches any story. And sure. we're like, if we can take those things and layer them on top of one another and do it in an artful way. We think we can bridge the gap so that people start looking into automotive and saying, wow, I never imagined that. That seems like a great place to work. But is this going to be like a limited, like a four or five, six part documentary? Yeah. Because my we, point is, is how from, from, from a consumer standpoint or an audience standpoint, after they've seen two or three and they go, Okay, so they're all nice people working in dealership. Like, what's that hook to keep them coming back? Yeah. Or is it just here's a here's a six part series about what automotive is, and then you're done? No, our plan is for multiple seasons. Uh, season one, uh, we're planning eight to ten episodes, mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to like we're we're learning as we go. Right, we did the pilot sure. episode. You can see that for free right now. Um, we're, we have another one. It's almost done, 
Episode three is going to be released uh, later in September and episode four, we're actually going to film uh, in early September. So um, there's, there's already a queue, right? We're trying to like fund it and do it. Every episode is going to be a little different. Um, and we're also going to try to bring in an element of education, right? Cause like think of consumer side, there is questions. There are, there's like some confusion around like, well, why does every dealer want to buy my car all of a sudden? Or right. what is, what does it mean when like someone says special finance around me? <laughs> right. And so like bringing some also like to take some of the cloudiness away right. from what used to be behind the curtain in the industry, mm -hmm. because that doesn't exist anymore. And we think that if the, the auto dealers have like a very, a very out front way of explaining it to customers and we provide the conduit for that, we also think it's a reason that people will watch. And, you know, this, the world that we live in, it's not just about the episodes. Right. And as we work mm -hmm. to get these on Amazon prime, Apple TV, Yes, every dealer's been like, hey, look, look, there's something about my industry on, on Apple TV right. that isn't about a scam, you know? <laughs> right. Um, you know, so they're going to see that, but you know, the world is lived in 30 to 60 second increments mm -hmm. on social media. So to provide ourselves with a lot of like 30 and 60 second boosts that we can put out there that people just move closer, I guess, right. is like when you say like, why are you doing this? I think all of it, all of it, whether it's we do three seasons, or five, C whatever it is, bring the characters to the table and have everyone just take a little step closer and a little step closer. And so like, that's kind of the grand vision. I don't know which way it's going to run. Right. You know what I mean? Like, we'll see. We'll we're going to do one season and then we're going to see what see, season see what, two holds. That's for usually so, what yeah. they say. So yeah. on <laughs> that point, because wh where you just touched, I think is, is a good topic as well. So there's probably a lot of people who are watching this and you know we we set this i set this podcast up to help people who are taking on projects or taking on a team or taking on something and they're like to that point i don't know where it's ending or i have a vision how to get to the goal and i see where it's going so for you guys but again i like this idea of behind the scenes so how do you as teammates or your team how do you two kyle and paul how do you divvy up the roles and then how are you both? Are you both each owning a project or do you both have your own sort of skill set where Paul handles X, Kyle handles this? Share that because I think with so many things going on, it's no different than a manager in a dealership per se saying, I got to worry about new, I got to worry about use, I got to worry about this, I got to go over here and check service, I have to do that. And I got 15 things going on. It could be the equivalent of, well, we have to record auto collabs and then we have our morning thing and how do we get our newsletter out and how are we doing this? We have to travel and film. So I think there's a lot of that. So talk to us about that structure behind the scenes. How do you orchestrate the madness? Yeah, so... I'll go with that because that's uh, that's my that's like actually functionally figuring that out is more in my wheelhouse. So I'm I, I, I we consider myself the COO and Paul the CEO, and then the the kind of like third leg to that is Michael Cirillo, who you know, uh, mm -hmm. who's recently in the last six months come on as our chief of staff, and he's really there to care for and see uh, the people on our team grow and succeed and understand how their role fits in with everybody else's role. So that's where he he lives on a day to day basis is like, how's the team feel? How's the team performing? Like, what's the boots on the ground feeling right now? And how are they mm -hmm. interacting with each other to make sure that like, everybody can move fast together. Yeah. And everybody can follow the speed of Paul and Kyle, because we do we make decisions on a dime and, and go quickly, right? For us, the separation is like this. We always know that pretty much everything that either of us do, the other one can crossfade into if we need to, right? We have right. similar skill sets that that can crossfade, but um, Paul is is definitely, uh, he leans into anything that is visionary and creative in our world. So um, if it's like coming down to a decision on what design we go with or What's the big trajectory that we're headed, that we're working on these next two weeks, or why are we doing something, communicating those types of things or, or progressing in that way, um, communicating with uh, some of our, our best, our, our most integrated partners mm -hmm. uh, so that they, they still feel close to us. That's kind of Paul's lane, right? He 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 works with our creative director and works with our creative team more often to make sure that like 
the creative matches the vision, matches right. the way that we want to go to market. For me on the operation side, like if it has to do with setting up a spreadsheet or understanding how the technologies connect, uh, you know, cause we're, we're just like, just like car dealers, we got a tech stack, you know, I, I actually put it on, on LinkedIn a couple months ago. It's like, Hey, we have a tech stack that we have to manage that we have to make sure is interconnected that integrates with everything that communicates. Well, we know where all our people are. If someone unsubscribes here, they get unsubscribed there. All of those things still happen, even not for dealers. Right. right. Um, and then also like, if there's any, you know, functional financial stuff kind of uh, sits in my world as well. So that's how, that's how those divvy up. But Hey, look, if I'm on vacation or Paul's on vacation and he's got to take a finance call or I got to make a creative decision and we just trust each other to do those things. So it's fun. We, we like, uh, uh, you know, like people, people see us and, and we look alike, but there's sometimes this like creepy, you know, we finish each other's sandwiches. You know? <laughs> that's what I was going <laughs> to say. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you yeah. meant. <laughs> so, Paul, how do you see how, from from your vision? Because again, I, I get it. Working with someone, my brother and I are very have similar but dissimilar um, uh, skill sets, and and yeah. I probably lean more towards Kyle and let Brian go out there and you know do what he does. But from your perspective, what you what are some of the things that are key that you would share that you have in place for yourself to keep yourself with that vision in mind that you don't get so bogged down in details or go down the rabbit hole that you, you know, you don't want to lose that there, you know, the vision there's yeah. where we're going. So share that with them. Because again, I think there's sometimes people get who who are listening to this, get so caught up in that today's success that they lose track of where the heck they're going. Yeah, that's that's a very big, big challenge for me. I, I mean, there are so many moving pieces in business, especially in the auto industry, but in just entrepreneur life in general, so many moving pieces. It is hard not to look at the thing that needs to be done right now and then look up two weeks later and being like, oh, we didn't even do that. Right. That's right. the reason we started doing any of this, you know? And so I get that. Um, and Before I answer that, though, I do want to talk about a lot of people in your audience certainly either have a partnership. Um, a lot of people in automotive have partnerships. It's just a, it's an industry where there just are a lot of partnerships, same store partners in multiple stores, partners in this, you have GMs that are partners in stores, right? It's rife with different levels of partnerships. And I'll say this, I think the real key to why Kyle and I are able to work so well together is that we always assume the other person has the best intentions. In whatever Absolutely. decision they're making mm -hmm. and whether or not together or we're separate, right? Because we, we do approach things a very similar way, but a lot of things we will approach it from a different angle. And I think if you're in a partnership and you can't think like right now, like, oh, that person, I'm, when they're acting, I know they always have my best intentions right, right, right in mind, whatever decision they're making. I think if it's breaking down at that point, then there's probably some conversations that need to have be had and some work to do because just that puts such a burden on an organization. If all of a sudden you're kind of like, yeah, why exactly? Yeah, did they I, I do think that? that's, that's huge. I think that's a really good tip. I hope everyone wrote that down. Not that you're looking for the conflict, but it's asking yourself, do my, does, do my teammates have the best intention trying to succeed? I always believe, and maybe it's a little naive, but I always believe that most people go to work trying to do the right thing. Sometimes yeah, yeah. they just might be doing it the wrong way or they, no one gave them the guidance. So they're trying there, but there are people, but I think that even with good intentions, you can, there can become this little selfishness of, well, I'm always right. He doesn't know I'll take care of this. And then you start blocking them out. And then it's not that it's directed to say, well, Paul doesn't know what he's talking about it, but it becomes just that, well, I know I'm always right. So I'm just going to do this. So I really think that's important to always say to yourself, do I tr truly believe the partners that I'm working with at the leadership table on my team, are we all heading in this right direction with the right intentions? And, and, and I think that's important. The, there's just so many, there's so many dynamics, like even in Kyle Mai's partnership, right? We're partners in a SODU. I have an agency that he's not a partner in. He has a tech company that I'm not a partner in, right? All these worlds kind of intersect. And we have a consulting business together, Kyle and I, <laughs> right? And sometimes 
our other companies work together on a consulting clients thing, right? It's just like to, to know that like, and it's like that in a lot of automotive too, which is why I bring mm -hmm. that up to know yeah. that like in the end, like I want to make sure he wins. He wants to make sure I win. Right. And when we do that, everybody wins knowing that we have these vulnerabilities that you were just talking about. Everyone comes wanting to do a good job. Right. But you have these strengths also have a vulnerability, right? If you're very compassionate, you could also be very passive and enabling, right? You know if you're funny? very discerning, you could also be very mm -hmm. critical. Yep. What's funny is, so we were in Tampa and we kind of did a little shot of just, just digging into the history of a soju <laughs> and we've still got more, more to, to flesh out from that interview because we, I think both of us were able to clearly kind of delineate what, what we're doing here, similar to what we're saying here. But, um, Paul asked probably the best question that's actually freed us up um, for for uh, in a lot of other ways. He asked me because uh, we interviewed each other in this and he asked me, he said, what's one quirky thing about working with Paul? Right. And referencing himself. And in that moment, I mean, I knew the thing right off the bat. It's like Paul has no clue what day it is. Right. And let alone like when well, we're traveling somewhere, where we're going. Day about him yeah. forgetting dates. So I <laughs> yes, thought that exactly. Was really and then I forgot a date the other day. Right. It was, <laughs> yes. it was quintessential. On show, the blind. I, right. on show. I was, I was like, before I say anything about this on the show, I'm like, <laughs> Am I right? Because right, right. I'm probably wrong. Right. Yeah. So that was like, it was a really freeing thing for me to just say like, hey, here's something that like I know <laughs> is a vulnerability of Paul's that sometimes it takes me or someone else on our team to to work around or, or to or to be aware of. Right. And then with Paul, he, he was like, man, Kyle, sometimes he just can't say words right. Right. Yeah, just, he's going so just fast going, that the words don't actually go together. <laughs> they don't actually go together, which is really hard. When you're a content communication company, and sometimes my words just make zero sense, right? <laughs> right. Because I get so excited. And so it's actually freed us up in other ways since we've even like since that moment to recognize those little micro flaws that maybe would annoy some people because they just harbor them. And me just be able to be like, bro, you never, this is always, you always miss here, right? Or like, he'll say to me, like, why are you doing that? You know? Well, and it becomes humor and you're diffusing yeah. it and you're it's giving okay. it other It makes permission. it okay. Makes it okay. Right? Yep. Absolutely. You're I will say that since, since you yeah. said that, I've really been trying hard to get dates right. I know. I've been impressed. It's really quite impressive. <laughs> listen, we all I really want to do a good we, job everywhere. <laughs> listen, we all we all have our quirks and we all have them. But I think that again, I think that's a key for for really being one self-aware for yourself. But number two is allowing your teammates to see a vulnerability, but also that vulnerability is not that crippling to you that people can joke about it or you joke about it yourself and that allows people to go oh and then it doesn't become a big thing because exactly. if it became a big thing if every time i said hey paul you missed a date you get mad and you're frustrated well yeah but you did this and i'm like uh <laughs> yeah can't you're bring walking it up on then. eggshells yeah, exactly. and you, yeah you can't do that so let's talk about a soda con because again that part of the reason i wanted to get you on early here buzz a soda con, you know, last year was the first one in Philly. It was phenomenal. Had a lot of people talking about this is unlike all other automotive conferences. So I'm going to ask you this question because I was thinking about it. I know the intention is always to make it different, you know, something different than they've seen. But there still has to be aspects of familiarity for yes, audience absolutely. members to come. Still or a live going, event. Yes. What the hell am I walking into? <laughs> so where did you, when you were mapping this out, or what have you learned from last year to going to this year to saying, we might have to lean in or maintain this familiarity or structure, but we can go wider on this or something different so that when someone does come here, they go, they walk away energized versus, well, that was a waste of my time. I think one one thing that we learned really quickly um, in year one is that we tried to cram too much in. Mm -hmm. um, we, ha we have a lot of ideas and we kind of run at hyperspeed all day, but you can't move conferences at hyperspeed and expect people to be able to keep up. 
And right. so we, we, we gave the schedule more breathing room this year and, and more structure. Um, but one of the things that I think we, we abandoned largely year one, part of the, one of those areas of familiarity was a trade show floor. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have that. And we're like, we're going to approach it with this activation mindset, which was very progressive and automotive. When you go to other conferences, uh, it's a lot of activations, right? It's less booths, more activations. And we're like, let's, so, so let's explain that to the audience. Audience. So an activation, your list, like, activation automotive mindset is um, you go to a room and that room has 10 by 10s or 20 by 20s. And you go and there are people stand there. And that's where you talk to them. And that's where you interact with them by looking at a demo or whatever. Mm -hmm. An activation mindset is more free form where maybe we're going to do a VR thing that you can engage with, not at a booth, right? Because it, it gets you in, think more environmentally, what's going on right. in the building at the time. And how can I keep you in the flow of what's going on and not compartmentalize your mind to say, now I'm standing at this booth to talk about this thing. So you know, and activations take all shapes and sizes. Sometimes it could be Red Bull handing out cans at a festival, right? Sometimes it could, it could be, Hey, like tried to play this game. Sometimes it could be, um, you know, why we have this artist here. Why don't you put these headphones on and you're going to listen to the new technology that we have in our product, right? right. Because it's experiential. Right. Um, However, we went too far. Like there were some great activations. Uh, like we had like A to Z Sync had a little thing set up. Um, you know, VinQ did bring this VR thing. We had a big, big iPad phone where you could stand there and press things. However, we realized that our industry partners wanted somewhere to call home, right? They needed to establish somewhere. And attendees also want somewhere to talk about a certain thing. Right. Right. It was a little free form. So we were like, let's anchor this sucker with a, a different format trade show floor, but still a trade show floor. So just to to cut myself off there, but like that's one thing that we realized and we kind of skidded back to this and say, let's make that an element of the event. Well, I think so. So as someone who puts on events, that is always, you know, a a, a balance. But I think if what I loved hearing was this idea of not trying to cram too much in because we've been yeah. guilty of that of wanting to make sure everybody got value but at the end of the you know by a certain period of time people's brains just can't take any more information but when we we you know when we polled our audience they wanted more time i don't want to say it's not downtime it's networking time where they were networking able time. to yeah. go i just listened to Kyle and Paul talk up there i need to digest that a little bit and I want to be able to walk around and see some cool tech and talk to these people here. And then maybe after that half an hour, then we go back and we learn versus here's another one and here's another one. And you haven't even digested this one. And now you're talking to another. So I think it is, I like that idea of anchoring because both sides want that. They want to know also where to go back and find them, where if it's day one and I met Kyle over here with his magical technology and it was an activation live. Now, all of a sudden, I, yeah, I want to talk to where, where the heck is he? So no, neither person has a home to be able to really take that conversation forward. So, so I like that. So talk to me about content. What, what's the theme of this year's a soda con you know, if you can share some of the speakers and some, I, I know there's a big bright yellow one, but, um, <laughs> you know, talk to me about that. So why, why, why is the content key and why should people be coming to a soda con this year for that content? One of the, this is like a, a silent theme, but we've been talking about it a lot. One thing that we, um, we didn't do as well as we wanted to last year. And we've done a lot better with this year is, the balance of percentage of, of the type of speakers, right? So uh, last year, about one third of our speakers were uh, from dealerships, right? Actual mm -hmm. like dealership personnel. Uh, this year, just just looked at it, 58% of our, of our speakers right now are from dealers, right? So over 60 speakers, but 58% of them being dealers, dealership personnel um, with, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, 35% being industry partners and then some others like outside of industry people that mm -hmm. we're bringing in like Jesse Cole, like Dr. Nicole Lipkin. Um, and so that's like a, it's a, it's maybe a silent theme. It's not the theme on the billboard or on the, on the graphics. Um, we themed it uh, maybe too early. Collaboration is critical, but I, we still believe in that. 
Um, and, and that's why a lot of our panels host industry partners and dealers. And, and we've, you know, all of our mini keynote sessions require, you know, the industry partners that, that are, are partnering with us for those, they require them to bring the, a dealer into mm -hmm. the conversation. Um, and so there's, there's that collaboration, just really recognizing like, Hey, if we're not all in this together, uh, and moving in the same direction, then everything's going to fall apart because the train's just not going to have the glue to hold it up. Um, but there will, there will, there will definitely be a lot of tinges of this more than cars thing that we were talking about. Right. The, right. The but what I, what I, what, right, I, what so. I liked, I just wanted to pinpoint the one thing you said there and having that dealer partner there where I see some conferences lacking and, and it ties into just even the way that we disseminate information in our businesses or in a dealership is it's this lack of helping them integrate to point B because I could tell you what to do and you walk out and you go, that's a great idea. And then I go back and I go, I don't know how to do it. But if I see another dealer and I understand dealer language, they say, well, here's my problem here. Here's the partners that we got together. I remember we had a panel at one of our conferences with uh, Gino Walsh from the Cavalli group. And he brought all of the three vendor partners that he had that solved the problem. He said, here's my problem. And I got these three together. They had to learn how to play nice in the sandbox. So they, yep. the vendors talked about how they had to learn to play nice in the sandbox, but also it showed how that collaboration could work. And then here's the payoff. And it was a dollar amount and specifics. And the dealers were going, I love that because problem vendors telling me how there was solution, but now I see the, end goal. And I think that to your point, having that, that's where that collaboration is key and explaining that potential, any frustrations you have with new vendor partner versus me, how did we get past any, you know, working together sort of hurdles and things like that. I think that's, I think audiences like hearing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I, I like, I think sometimes there's this fear on our end, at least like this internal fear, like, oh boy, the industry partners are going to, you know, sell, sell, sell. And I've started to like rethink that, like, wait a second. Okay. So if the sales of that actually solves a problem for a particular dealer group, then that's good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so let's just connect it to the ground. Let's make sure that it actually gets to the ground of like, this is someone that's practically doing that way. And, and the reality is, is, you know, all of these, every industry partner, I, you would, and I know a lot of them, you would struggle to have me find one that doesn't have like a competitive match somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe there's one really random one out there, but one is going to be better for dealer X than mm -hmm. dealer Y That's because right. of their processes, their people, the way that they go to market, their particular market segment. You would, right, you would never find vehicle. two identical right. use cases. Exactly. No, not at all. Not in this industry. I, no, and I think that I think where where we're talking, I think the exciting thing is is that yes, in the past there were people who vendor A just their workshop was let me tell you how great my product is. That wasn't really solving a problem. It was just selling you a product. I think we've all evolved, and I think all of the presenters have evolved over time because no one wants to hear that. But if you have, to your point, is the dealer leading the charge to say, here was my issue. And I found vendor A or vendor A saying, uh, I was reached out to by Paul's Toyota, who said, I have a problem and here's how we collaborated to solve it. And then the dealers talking about, I think those are more tactical to you say a little more in the weeds Absolutely. to say, but it's getting the audience to go, Ooh, I never thought about that. Oh, I had to make sure this and this and this happened. You're like, Ooh, never thought about that. And you yeah. really want people writing down some steps to be able to go back and say, that was exciting. So then when they're networking, then when they're on the, you know, outside of the learning and they're having a drink or they're eating dinner or they're eating a meal and they walk over and go, so Kyle, when you were doing this, what else did you, I think that's what attracts a attendees to a conference is when they go back, they said it was time well spent. Yep. That where I got things, but I also learned how to, not just what to do. And now I don't know what my next step is, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. You know, we struggle with, we struggle with the perception that our events are just fun. If that, like, 
Well, who no, would have that no. problem? Yep. Right. You know, like, oh, is it just a party? Is it just bombastic and like great swag and lights and music? Because from the outside, it could look like that. And this year, we're really intentionally trying to say, actually, if you look at our roster and look at our audience, they're some of the most sophisticated operators in the business. And they're willing to come here and share with you. And that doesn't mean we're not going to have a ton of fun and have Taco Tuesday and bring mm -hmm. in Jesse Cole from the Savannah Bananas to be a keynote and have a great band from Nashville to make sure that like everyone can have a good time if they want to come and just engage, engage in that, that we're going to have live tonight from the stage because we know that we know people's attention spans. And like sure. you said, people's brains get full. So to intentionally build a format that gives your brain a minute to breathe and all like when you smile and when you laugh, something happens with your biology, your endorphins and like those mid afternoon, like drowsy moments, like can go away really quick when all of a sudden the energy in the room steps up because of a thing you didn't expect. And so right. that's one of the stigmas that we're trying to like, we realize is happening with us sometimes that people might not look at it as a serious event because it's so progressive as well. And so. You know. I think, well, listen, I can definitely agree. I think there's people who have said this just looks like a party, but that also yeah. comes down to what you're marketing, right? If you're marketing, hey, we're going to have this and we're going to have this and we're having Taco Tuesday, people are like, well, what are we learning? Or even if you're saying we have Jesse Cole and we have this, I've been to conferences where they bring someone in from the, uh, you know, outside the industry. But if that, if they're not a good speaker or we haven't as, uh, event operators explain the audience and what I need from you to connect to them. So I can it's just hype, right? It's just, yeah, well, yeah, then it goes over my head and they go, well, it's so great. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? But if it's, here's what Jesse's going to teach you how to take what he did to what he did, what you can do in yours. People are like, Ooh, that's an interesting take. Or yep. if you're saying, listen, we know that you're going to have this and this and this, and we know that your brain's going to go, but that's why we're going to have build your own Sunday at four o'clock and the ice cream <laughs> bin over here. Oh, Whatever. that sounds great. Why we do that? Oh, we got to call the venue, Paul. <laughs> you know, my point is, is that then there's a payoff. It's like little kids. If you think about it, I'm not saying we're all little kids, but we still have it in as like, if we really focus for the next two hours, we can have tacos. And if we focus really <laughs> good, and you can build your own Sunday and we can go. And I think it's that balance, but it is selling the themes of what collaboration is important and what that means. And here are five things you're going to learn, or here's three things you're going to learn. Like we, I think that to me, helps balance the fun because if you listen to your conversations uh, in all of your podcasts there's tons of great information but you guys are laughing and joking and have a good time and i think that's why people come back so you don't want to give it away but like you're saying is how do i find the balance to say you're going to walk out of here with a lot of really good information to help your business get better and you're also going to laugh and you're going to have fun and there's music i mean nada does that but for some reason, they've convinced you like that's it. But I think you can do that without without sacrificing that. So um, we'll make sure that a soda con is all of this is in here. I want to just touch on two more things before we get out of here. One is um, so as I've seen now, you're you know you're growing your team. You have Michael here, and you're traveling and everything else like that. How are the families doing? How are your families doing? Because sometimes I know when you're on the road and you're taking care of a lot of these different things, there is that. So how are the families doing with you guys being so busy? I'm going to say this is that I think with. both of our families right now are like holding their breath as September rolls around because we both, I think, speak for both of you, have a pretty awesome summer with minimal travel. Right. And yeah. we've had some vacation time between the two of us. We've been able to like really like lean in. Kyle moved into a new house. Like it's been a good refreshing season. And so I think speaking on my behalf, it's like my family is good and we're happy, ready for the school year. And then we're like, just like Labor Day's here now. So we're looking at like September and a soda con is a big deal. And then we're looking at like October and mm -hmm. November and we're like, and it's all the oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think yeah. the reason I ask is I think it's important because we all work very hard and there's a lot of people in, especially in automotive, where there's a lot of hours and there's a lot of stress. And I think it's important for us to make sure I I, I, I watched something on, uh, you know, scrolling through the other day and I thought it was great. And it's not about religion or anything else like that. But the guy was saying about reaping. He goes, you know, you can't 
so, you know, you reap what you sow, but you got to sow first to reap. He goes, but you can't reap from your business. You can't reap from your family if you haven't sowed into your business and sowed into your family and sowed into this. And I thought that's pretty good because a lot of times some there's not a lot of sowing going into the family at time and there's a lot of reaping or demands. And I thought that's pretty damn smart. And so that's why I wanted to ask you guys, because you guys do move a mile a minute and you do share about families, but I think it's a really important thing to find that balance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so uh, go ahead. Yeah. My family's, we just, uh, we started homeschool and I moved into a home office. So we got this new <laughs> thing where like we see each other a few times a day when I need water. So it's a, uh, it's, it's pretty fun. So. No, listen, I, I work at home and I will tell you during COVID and during even some of that time, like even when my older son went back to school when he was a senior this past year, you know, he'd come home with his friends because they could leave school to come home for lunch and they would bring lunch and they'd sit here and we'd talk or having the time to just purposely say from 12 to one, I'm trying not to schedule meetings so I can make them lunch or I can have lunch with them that really made a difference, like being able to go into my room and do my work and they knew, but there was time like, okay, I'm here for lunch. And can you make me this? Can you make me this? Let's talk. It also helped me to break the sense of all of a sudden you're just working in that burnout. So I, I, I think you'll find working at home has a lot of pros, a lot of, a lot of pros for you. So that's good. Um, so lastly, as like I say, I always ask one thing so you guys can bounce around uh, or you both can just answer the question. Just two parts this time. So you guys are doing such a great job to inspire others. You really are. And you're sharing a lot of great content. What are you consuming? Like either what are you consuming to give your mind a break or what are you consuming to inspire you guys so that, you know, I want to be able to, you know, share that out with people too, to say, hey, listen, this is a good book. You know, I got this new book I'm just starting called Stay uh, stay Sane, the guy who was Tom Brady, <laughs> you know, stay Wait a minute, in a Tom, crazy that didn't world. look like Tom Brady. No, no, Greg Harden. He was like a mentor, you know, a coach for him. Why does so Tom Brady say say his name on that book so big? Well, because he was, uh, this guy worked with him for years. Oh, okay. Mentally work with him. So anyway, <laughs> if you're just so, listening, so Glenn, what, what Glenn held up a book thinking? and it just says Tom Brady. And it's a picture of a guy who's in, I, I would Brady. go over here and pull <laughs> the innovation stack just because that's your favorite one. But, I see uh, it. I noticed okay. it the second I logged in. <laughs> okay. So tell me, what are you guys reading, doing to inspire yourselves or just take a mental break? You can tell them about soccer, Kyle, or should I? Yeah. I mean, I'm a runner and I watch soccer. Like that's just, that's how I, that's how I release. That's how I think that's how I uh, get out on my own, you know, whether it's a long run over a weekend or my 4am runs every single day. And then uh, I definitely watch soccer um, go. and go to Nashville SC games. Like that's my recharge. Um, I, you know, I'm not like a massive book reader. I'm like a four or five a year guy. Mm -hmm. Um so I'll let Paul talk about the big book that we've been talking about all summer. Maybe he's got yeah. another one that he's reading already, no, but that, I, that don't, I don't, yeah. I don't. I used to read like, I used to read like a book every two weeks and now it's like, eh, maybe I'll do three a year if it's, if, mm -hmm. if we're lucky. Um, I think maybe that's because we just do so much reading, Kyle. We, that's the thing. Like we literally, whether it be news or other reading, every like morning, just, it's like yeah. we're in thousands of words a day just in the yeah. morning through. But either way, so I'm a little disappointed about this one because I got this book when it came out and I knew it was coming out because of my ties with Simon Sinek. And he's like, we're publishing this book. It's great. It's coming out. We're going to let you know about it first. And it's this one, Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara. And we were like, when this came out, I was like, Kyle, you got to read this. He read it. We're like, this is actually our trajectory, right? We're going to get like Will at a soda con and we're going to like do this book club. And then like, we kind of, there's one of those things like we got busy and then we just start seeing it everywhere. We're like, man, we would have called this one a long time ago, but Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara is I think one of the most inspiring stories of a focus on changing an industry. Like this restaurant industry, it used to be all about the chef and his food. And Will was like, no, it's got to be equally be about that was 11 the hospitality, Madison, right? 11, 11 Madison, Madison Park, Park, right? Yeah. You come from hospitality. You understand this. That was the Danny so, Meyer school. It was, it was. And so, so I have his this book, book setting the table somewhere. Oh here. yeah. Another great one. one. Another, another great one. one. 
And yep. so do that. And, you know, I love the NFL. So Eagle season's coming up. Oh, and I stay out of like the draft. Now I stay out that. of the draft drama. When we get through without the Eagles mention. No. <laughs> but it's no. all right. Not now. You could have gotten through it without it like a month ago because I don't pay attention to offseason stuff. I don't have time for that. But it's about to get serious. So Eagles football is kind of my three hours where I get to just like be a different person for a while. <laughs> all right. So, well, okay. Yeah, you'll probably be different, right? Yeah. <laughs> very calm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, it's like a very um, animated running. All right. Game. So tell audience members who don't know, how can they connect with you guys personally? Where can they sign up for the newsletter and watch all of this? And we'll put it all in the show notes as well. Okay. So asotu.com, A-S-O-T-U.com is kind of the gateway to our almost half a dozen podcasts and shows, our daily email you can sign up for, which is that drip Glenn was talking about. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's kind of like our best shot every day, day in, day out. A um, couple other things linked out from there. The TV show is More Than Cars, morethancars.tv. You can see the pilot episode and know when the other ones are coming out. And the big the big bang coming up, a SotuCon, the end of September, it's a SotuCon.com. So those, that's yeah, that's our world. And sure Kyle and I are on there. LinkedIn. You can search our names. You can find us. Yeah. We answer our DMs and all the good they stuff. They do. They're not that big yet. They're getting not there. That, we're not that fancy. Yeah, to, yeah, that's not not big. Fancy is a better word. But fancy. yes, go to a SodaCon. It's, it's worth your time. It is definitely one of the best uh, conferences out there. Speaking as someone who hosts conference, this is one that you thank definitely you. want to see. Um, so again, audience, um, I just want to thank you both very much. You guys can listen. Uh, uh, we'll read read you out of the show in a moment, but I want to thank you both very much. Again, please connect with these folks. They are worth your time. They are great, not just great entrepreneurs and great uh, assets to the industry. They're both really great people as well. So thank you both very much. You. Look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thanks, Clint. This episode was produced by Connor J. Pash. Thanks to PCG Digital for all of its support. If you found value in today's episode, please make sure you click the like button, the subscribe button, and share it out to your network. We look forward to seeing you each week for exciting conversations with industry leaders who are sharing their journey, their skills to help you become the leader that you're looking to be. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of You're in Charge. Now what? With Glenn Pash.